Welcome back to our conversation with Jamie Duncan on this Continuous X podcast, trying to solve for X in the SDLC equation. We pick up with Mike's follow-up question from our previous episode. For everything that Kubernetes is and it does, though, and I, I'm, I, I, it kind of harkens back on you that someone out there is going to create something different. Mm-hmm. Um, I all most of the industry, I think it was way back when AWS was like, "All right, fine, we'll create a Kubernetes engine." Um, yeah. and, and have that as an option. The, the the orchestration wars was declared over and done. Kubernetes won, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Um, everyone is now Kubernetes. And I all in the back of my mind, I always thought, you know, is that a great thing? Um, because if yeah. you're all if you're all using one technology, is it a complete Swiss Army knife? Is there are there edge cases that we're missing? Are there advancements that are being hampered because it's going to be stuffed into this one mode of operand, uh, you know, m- one mode of operating. Um, I mean, yes, it's very versatile. Yes. You can, you can, can address nearly everything, but it almost seems too powerful, too limiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can. Yeah. Like I, I keep, I always pop back there and I think it was like the second Batman movie with Michael Bale with Christian Bale. Okay. Um, where he's at the very beginning of it, he's trying to fight some bad guys, and like his suit is so bulky and heavy, he can't like he can't bend his arm, <clears throat> and he's complaining over the microphone while getting punched in the face. <clears throat> you can get there with Kubernetes. You can overload. You can do too much, and there's got to be this ROI measure. The trick with Kube is it was designed to be pluggable, so. When you start looking at Kubernetes as a tool to be used and not just as this sort of abstraction of your world, everything is called a controller. Mm. So if I want to run a a container, there's a thing called the pod controller. And I can go in and edit that source code if if it suits my business needs. Every single thing that Kubernetes does has a pluggable controller in it. Um, one of the more common ones we run into all the time, especially if customers are sort of doing bespoke work, is the, the SDN component. So you can swap out different software-defined networks. Most people use Calico, but there are tons of them right. out there because the networking is a controller. It's just this plug that I slot the code in. As long as the code that's running answers, speaks to the API server properly, I can do anything. Um, you can swap out container runtimes. Right. Uh, like Red Hat does that with, with Podman. Um, a couple of years ago, I was working with the Singularity guys. They were this sort of, the, this HPC-centric container runtime. Without a mountain of effort, we had Kubernetes. It was actually an older version of OpenShift running with Singularity as the container runtime. Mm-hmm. It's fully functional. It had to answer like eight things, you know, coming and going from the API server. So that is, that's kind of the, the architectural genius inside Kubernetes is that everything is pluggable. Mm-hmm. Um, and that got adopted really early for almost everything except the container runtime. And there was this whole thing, the Docker shim. You might have heard in the news a while back, the Docker shim got removed. Oh, my God, the world was going to like flip over. That was the only thing that was hard-coded at the beginning was that it had to run Docker. And so they stuck this little shim code in to let it talk to other things. Well, they finally, you know, that's just sort of mainline code path. So they finally got rid of that. But Kube can do everything. If you have a lot of really heavy security standards and a lot of really heavy security, not compliance, but security needs, OPA, Open Policy Agent, OPA is what they like to call it. You plug that puppy in and you can actually run security policies on the API calls before the objects get created. So before the app is even deployed, you know if the app is fulfilling all of your security policies, you know, Talk making sure it's in the right place, making sure it's in the right thing. Talk about shit so, left. Yeah, exactly. Well, and that's like we that's what another of those things that we talked about all the time. And we never could get to mm-hmm. until tools like Kubernetes got realized. Dragging the security guy onto your team was just a, a lesson in futility <laughs> eight years ago, um, <laughs> four years ago. <clears throat> it was just a reason to start an argument. <laughs> but the, the pluggable nature of it means it's designed to evolve. So as we have better ideas, 
as we have better ways to isolate processes, as we have better ways to orchestrate things across hosts, it's designed. The, the goal being there's this very small chunk of Kubernetes up at the top that is the API server that defines how I talk back and forth to my infrastructure. And then underneath it, I can plug in all these different things to actually go get that work done. And there's no real tight coupling there. As long as everybody fits the spec and the spec is pretty, you know, the spec isn't ridiculous. It's like eight or right. 10 things normally. Right. I can put anything in. So as it evolves, as it, you don't even, in fact, for most of the controllers technically don't even have to run Golang, at least to my memory. So you can write controllers in other languages. They just need to talk to a socket or talk to a, a port on, on the host. <clears throat> so you can do all sorts of crazy, like you can Kubernetes super weird. Um, in fact, like the last couple years of, of KubeCon have been how weird can you Kubernetes? <laughs> like, like that it's kind of become that like a contest of, like, I can do this crazy, ridiculous thing. Um, not my favorite question to answer, but always something that's fun for a laugh. But I always think that's a little bit of a risk reward um, scenario, especially when you're dealing with the public sector. You don't want to get too far out of your lane because you yeah. got other people maintaining this. This is an ongoing system. This is not yep. your little baby that you're going to run forever. And that's where you get into like, I, I don't remember who I stole it from. I remember the day I stole it, but I don't remember who I stole it from. Um, we, I was talking to a three, one of the three letter agencies. We were up on site out in the middle of nowhere, West Virginia. And I asked them, this was when it was the hype train was at its sort of initial steamy beginnings of, you know, if I go do some of this Kubernetes, I've solved all my problems. Right. Right. You know, like before it was like, if I could do some of this open stack, I've solved all my problems. If I could do some of this virtualization, I've solved, you know, this was very early in the hype cycle for Kubernetes. And I asked them, I was like, are you, does your mission, is your goal to be a creator of this technology or a consumer of this technology? Nice. Is your business intrinsically tied to creating Kubernetes? Because you can, you can go grab the bits off GitHub and roll the thing up. Yep. Go build. It works. Um, but do you need to? And should you? Like, where does that work? help your end users right. or should you be a consumer of this technology and use it for all of the good reasons we just talked about in a relatively defined, relatively sustainable way, working with a partner more often than not um, like Google cloud. <laughs> and, <laughs> sorry. I had to stick the plug in. I, I do um, I'm on the clock, man. I'm on the clock. <laughs> um, but um working with a partner that gives you those guardrails when you need them. Right. That gives you something that, okay, I know I'm not going to write documentation because nobody ever gets to docs. So I get to rely on the partner's documentation or I get to pay someone to write the documentation. So they'll actually do it. And I can be hit by a bus compliant. I can pass this three people down the road when my mission changes. Right. Right. I think that's uh, perfect, Jamie. We're going to cut it off there for this particular episode. We can go on for hours. This is a fascinating uh, Yeah, I can talk topic. about this stuff when Jesus comes uh, back. And you're a fascinating uh, speaker. So thank you for being our guest, and thank you to the listeners. Um, stay tuned for more episodes with Jamie in the um, uh, coming uh, quest to solve for X in the SDLC equation. <laughs>